Uh, for many years, I worked on a film about ayahuasca that took uh, uh, all my time, all of my savings, and, and a lot of uh, uh, many things more. But um, when we finally finished the film and we put it on television, uh, the, the film will be playing at four, by the way, if you want to watch it. Uh, the first thing that happened was that Health Canada called the doctor who had been featured in our film, who was working with ayahuasca, with addicts. And so the Ministry of Health called him and said, if you don't stop working with ayahuasca right now, we're going to put you in jail. So, uh, you know, we became very concerned that maybe it wasn't a good idea to make a film about ayahuasca period and, uh, and, that, uh, and that, you know, look at the, look at the results. And then, uh, and then a few months later, I got a call from, uh, from the other doctor who works in Peru, in Takiwasi, and he said, listen, we got a phone call from a Canadian guy who watched the film on television, and now he wants to start this very broad, wide research program that was so needed to finally establish the, the effectiveness of ayahuasca in the treatment of drug addictions. So uh, he, this is the man who watched the film on television and called the other doctor, and I'm very happy and glad to introduce. Uh, he will talk to you about what is a very uh, interesting and very necessary uh, research uh, that, had, that is now starting about how to ascertain the fact, what, you know, the usefulness of ayahuasca in the treatment of drug addictions. Brian Rush. Okay, we have only... You hear me okay? We have only 15, 10, 15 minutes, so I'm going to go quickly, but thank you for the nice introduction. And this is my first time to meet him, so it's very nice. Um, I want to talk about a project that has now begun. Uh, I'll go through the stages of uh, the project. I will conclude with uh, some information about the current status of the project. But more importantly for a conference like this, I wanted to back up a little bit and talk about what's the overall design to study a traditional medicine like ayahuasca. Uh, this quickly mentions some of our colleagues uh, in the room today. I don't have time to put them all up, but Anya is here, you know, Fernando, Selena is going to present later, Isabella's in the back, so it's a, it's a very large team. I don't have time to uh, acknowledge everyone. But I do want to say that uh, there's still a lot of ideas that we're exploring that are not finalized. Uh, so it's really my, my presentation of uh, the, the discussion so far, most of which we've agreed on, but I don't want to pretend to speak for everyone who's not here. <clears throat> I also want to uh, thank those who contributed to our crowdfunding uh, in 2013. We had, actually it was about 500 people by the end and we raised $40,000 on the internet for this project. The money came literally from uh, around the world. So uh, thank you for anyone in the audience. I know there's some at the conference who've come up and, and uh, supported us, and so from our heart, thank you. Um, I, this is what I wanted to cover today, and with the short time, the first point I will uh, go very, very quickly. I come at this not as uh, an expert at all in the study of ethogens. I come at it from 38 years of work as an addiction research specialist. Uh, I'm not a physician. I'm trained as a public health scientist. Um, and uh, I, have, I have my own experiences that I'm bringing, um, but I'm not coming at it as, as an expert like a Dennis McKenna or some of these other, other big guys. But I think that's helpful because I also have no particular bias. Uh, and others on the team, it's kind of a mix of, of experiences. I want to talk about the, the different research paradigms and then give an overview of the project. <clears throat> Very quickly, this is our reality in the addictions world. Uh, the need is much greater than our capacity to respond. Secondly, most people who have alcohol and drug challenges uh, do not go for help. Um, and it's not their problem. It's our systems is not organized to welcome them very well. Most people who come for alcohol and drug treatment are dealing with a lot of other challenges. So now we're beginning to see addictions treatment more in the context of global mental health. It still requires some special skills, but we're really dealing with people with problems in addition to addictions. And there's a, I could go on about there's justice-related problems, housing, uh, social problems, and so on. So addictions is just part of people's story. It's never really the whole story. And you heard the presentation, uh, most of you, of 
Gabor Mate and kind of where a lot of this is coming from. I don't need to cover that. So these are some of the realities. We have some common elements of what makes good programs. It should be no surprise to you that the most successful part of any particular program is the therapeutic relationship, kind of independent of what the technique is. But that aside, we do not have any one treatment approach that is most effective. If, if someone comes for treatment, it's a little bit like a lottery, where they go, who the therapist is, etc. There's no standard protocol anywhere in the world. And to summarize, I think we have a moral and therapeutic imperative to continue to look for options. So that's fundamental to the project. We also know that people with alcohol and drug problems are everywhere in our system. They're in emergency departments, physicians' offices, schools, and so on. So our response is bigger than a few specialists. It's bigger than having a few specialized programs. We need a community response, but unfortunately, the reality in many parts of the world is that the response no exists. <laughs> and in some countries, the people are looking to their traditional healers as the center of the healthcare system. So we've personally, I, my own take on our project is grounding this project in the study of traditional medicine. That said, we need evidence going forward. Everybody kind of knows that. The, the normalization, the globalization, the introduction of this medicine into routine practice is just not going to happen until we have good evidence. It's just the reality. Um, research is also good, generally. Uh, we establish some principles that people are safe and that they're going to be respected and treated properly. So research is good, but there's many different ways to know something. And that takes us to what's the research paradigm. Very quickly, and you've got all the experts at this conference who've done this research, we know a lot about the benefits of this, particularly for addictions. It, if you're in the daimi, you just know. If you're a community in the Amazon, you just know. Uh, ayahuasca helps with alcohol use and other drugs. We have long-term use, very low toxicity, no addiction potential. We have retrospective studies where people recall their histories and they've got better or improved with addictions. There are some prospective studies, but not too many. One recently in Canada and some in, in Takiwasi, but very small samples, et cetera, et cetera. And we have work such as Anya's with very strong qualitative data on, on the aspects of the experience that people found helpful. So we, we have a lot, but we need more. And I had to go through a process of trying to understand how we are going to come at this from a, a research perspective. And what's the best way to know something? And actually, the best way depends on who you want to convince. <laughs> So we need to convince policymakers, we need to convince the healthcare system, so we have to face their criteria, whether they are our criteria or not. So this is our vision, that traditional healing, including ayahuasca-assisted healing, is recognized as a legitimate part of the healthcare system. There is, however, a continuum of knowing. We have the traditional foundation we call the evidence-based pyramid, excuse me, the pyramid of evidence, I'll show you that. But we also have indigenous ways of knowing, and you heard about that in the panel yesterday. And a middle ground that we're exploring in this project is, is a paradigm that evolved out of the UK, actually, in the, the world of program evaluation and research, we call the realist evaluation paradigm. So here's our pyramid for establishing the benefits, say, of a medication for depression would be a good example. So you go through animal studies, case reports, case control, da 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 up to a systematic review where somebody stands back and analyzes all of the other studies and so on. You do not get a medication in the drugstore without this process. 
other kinds of therapies you might make it through, like cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing. Generally, we've gone through most of these steps. But there are many, many limitations to experimental controlled trials. One of the big ones is the people who actually make it all the way through the recruitment phase and participate, and you find them for follow-up, they really don't look like an average client anymore. So they're not really representative. And secondly, this is the most important for the work here, random controlled trials do not do a very good job for very complex interventions. So what about ayahuasca? We've heard a lot about the different combinations, the different ingredients, the different ways in which it's made. So part of the context of this medicine is its production. It's very complex. And I, I like the, the, the comment this morning, it's not like we don't really have wine. We have white wine, red wine, da, 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 da. So we're studying ayahuasca, but what is that? We have many, many different healing contexts. Thank you, Anya, for the wonderful slide I'd still like to use. Um, treatment is like not the same. The use of it is not the same, particularly in Brazil. Even having this project, which spans Brazil and, and other countries in Latin America, is complex because the, the usage is completely different. Very briefly, this is a very complex intervention to study with a controlled trial. Okay. The objective of an experiment is to randomly assign people into two conditions or more and make them as similar as possible. In other words, the objective is to eliminate context and isolate an intervention. So then you can say this intervention had this effect that it was not about this context or that context or this context. There's a problem in trying to do this paradigm with ayahuasca because everything depends on context. <clears throat> so this is our vision. So the question is, do we need a more holistic paradigm? And there is another paradigm. There's a paradigm that's emerged in the evaluation literature in the study of indigenous practices in North America in other parts of the world. And this paradigm, I'm speaking to the converted, uh, considers everything in its context. Nothing actually exists outside of its context, etc. I'm gonna have to speed up. So key principles, if we were to take a completely indigenous perspective, engagement, respect, using stories, building capacity back in those communities, interpretation of our data in the context of their cosmology, etc. This is the challenge. Okay, this is a challenge for ATOP because we are working in multiple countries and multiple communities. There's no way we can engage everyone we would need. Also, in the Brazilian context, there is no indigenous component, so it's a bit of a problem. But more importantly, we are particularly interested in ATOP in understanding the integration of this traditional practice with some Western psychotherapeutics. So in other words, we're trying to drill down and look at these ingredients. So this model, as, as pure and cool as it is, will not work for ATOP. So we're trying to reconcile these paradigms. And I'll just briefly mention and ask you if you're interested to do a Google on realist evaluation. Uh, the name uh, Pawson will come up. It's a very, very nice methodology. And the formula at the beginning kind of says it all. Intervention plus the context equals outcome. It's not intervention and outcome. Okay. So to make a, a longer story short, ATOP is not based on a clinical trial experimental model, although in one of the projects we're quite happy to do that. But it's based on a much broader mixed methodology. So what is ATOP? Fernando did a wonderful umbrella this morning at eight o'clock. So we think of ATOP as an umbrella that contains a set of core principles, procedures, core ethics, advisory committee, core elements, infrastructure, and under that exist the projects in each country. 
Um, can skip here, go right to the bottom. The countries currently underway and in the inactive stage are Peru, Mexico, and Brazil. Um, there's discussions underway how to do this in Argentina, but it's very quiet. They've had their own challenges around uh, uh, legislation and policing and so on, so we're very quiet. Under the ATOP umbrella, the focus is on addictions. So why addictions, not PTSD, why not depression? Uh, if you do research, you know you need to be focused. But more importantly, we see it as a, a global need. It's a way of really getting attention. Uh, when we have these data at the end, uh, it will have the attention of people because we're really struggling globally with the challenges around addiction. There's some core design. I think the most important thing here, it is a prospective design. We are not interviewing people who've been in treatment or have had ayahuasca experiences, but all the centers are using a common protocol to recruit people, and we have a, a common set of measures, uh, qualitative and quantitative, that will follow them over time. <clears throat> we have a set of core ethical principles that's been very interesting. Imagine trying to have all these people and all these centers agree on the credentials and the training of the curanderos. Just imagine that for a moment. Um, and so on. But we have our infrastructure. Uh, I'll leave you with the website, but up uh, just today. And many people have asked, well, where's the neuroscience? Uh, some of the sites are located in, in parts of the jungle, parts of, of Brazil, just no way to do any kind of real lab work. So it's not a core part of the project, but in areas like Mexico, we're thinking we could, we could do that. This is a list of our measures. I'm happy to send the package. One of the challenges here was having all of these tools translated, validated in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. So this was not easy. Um, we also have a core qualitative component. Marcelo Marcanti in Brazil, an anthropologist who's long experience in ayahuasca research, will be doing a site visit to each of the centers. We have participant interviews before they start, during, and after managers and staff and all of the centers will be using the same interview protocol, which means we can pull the data together for a cross-site thematic analysis. Uh, where are we now? This is our first start. We held a planning meeting in Terrapoto hosted by Takiwasi. Um, interesting thing about this slide, Davida is kind of the Peruvian drug agency who provided funding for the meeting. This was important. And my home institution, CAMH, which is a big teaching hospital in Canada, the same Canada that shut down Gabor Mati, my institution, a research institution, just said, go for it. So it really was uh, satisfying to me to have the kind of academic freedom to just go for it with the protection of my organization. It's, uh, obviously, uh, ayahuasca is not legal in Canada. So current status, real fast. Remember, each country has to get their money. We have an application was sent to the Canadian government with a funding opportunity for work in first uh, low-income countries. Uh, we were not successful, but, but we got a really good review. So it's going back to them. But through donated funds, we are now underway uh, in Takiwasi with funding also if there's any Peruvian here with a PhD or in the psychiatry, we need a we need a, we have a postdoc opportunity in the project. Um, pretty much everything, uh, all the core parts of ATOP will be underway in Takiwasi, but other centers have been identified, and we're in touch with them if we get the additional funding. In Mexico, <clears throat> Anya, just hold up your hands. I want to acknowledge you. Uh, has received. You know, she finished her PhD project in Germany on the subjective qualitative component, was successful in getting a postdoc scholarship to start this work in Mexico through the uh, UNAM University. And this is really important in the Mexican context. It's the first ayahuasca research project funded through the traditional mechanisms uh, in Mexico. In Brazil, Brazil's complicated uh, the the anti-drug agency is referred to as Senad. Um, we pulled together our team. We sent a proposal to them. They also sent back a really good review. Change a few things. We've sent it back to them. That was like May, so we're waiting. These are the three centers tentatively identified in, uh, in Brazil. 
So summary, for sure we needed to build upon the existing knowledge base. This is no question. Second, myself, and here's where I'm not speaking necessarily for the whole team, people have different perspectives, but generally we're agreed on this. Uh, ATOP is grounded in the study of traditional medicine. We're equally comfortable talking to colleagues in South Africa, or Australia, or anywhere in the world, and how they are approaching a similar topic. We're using the realist evaluation paradigm, but carefully and cautiously, uh, we'll be working to deconstruct the ayahuasca experience because it's actually almost, if not totally impossible to do that. Um, key messages at the end, we're grateful for the donations people gave uh, globally. We are going. Uh, we are collaborative. Uh, we are very patient. And we will be successful. Thank you. because in her proposal and then the ethics review there, the, the push is for at least blinded, but I'll let Anya describe her experience quickly. That was a very good comment. Thank you for this question. Um, it has been really challenging to see uh, how we comply to scientific standards uh, and do it in a reasonable way, because obviously people will find out in the first hour if they are in the uh, placebo condition or in the real con condition, because just the effect is overwhelming in many cases, right? And uh, so we came up uh, with following design. We'll have a, a one control group will just receive uh, standardized psychiatric treatment plus psychotherapy, standardized. So they get the psychiatric medications and psychotherapy, uh, standard of art in Mexico. Uh, one group will get ayahuasca ceremonies with psychotherapy. And the other group will get a placebo pill uh, which is supposedly a medication that will help them to uh, have a better psychotherapeutic uh, response or help them to deal with craving. Like, it will be like a herbal medicine with similar effects as the traditional psychiatric medication. So that's like the only more or less sensitive, uh, like reasonable design that came up to us. Thank you. I would just emphasize in all of the other sites there will be no control. Uh, we, we're just as interested in naturalistic long-term process, people's story over time. And I know the academic world will always say, well, where's the clinical trial, where's this and that. But in my world of addictions research, we're learning more from a, sm a small number of long-term follow-up studies than we are from another clinical trial with a small variation in the treatment. It's like, do we have like seven hours of treatment or 13 hours? Like that's kind of like really ridiculous. So, so the other sites, there will be no control. They are their own controls. But we also have, are using measures that are widely used and we will be comparing our outcome data to the standard of the industry, so to speak. Thank you. 
He just came to work with me in Toronto and he's starting off, I had a doubt, this is not good. <laughs> I just think the Brazilian context is so complex, I can't imagine recommending a program now. Uh, I, there's no one way, and whatever we recommended, I would just want to evaluate anyway. What's needed up in Manaus is going to be completely different than Porto Alegre. Or, and, then, and then we also have the complexity of the DIME and the UDV, which are providing treatment. They're not supposed to, but they are providing a lot of service kind of underground. Uh, in Brazil, ayahuasca is legal only in the context of the syncretic churches, not for treatment. So one, we would have a legal barrier right now. But two, I think we, we need to experiment, we need to find out there. Two of the programs here are outpatient programs. Uh, and they're widely advertised in the community of Sao Paulo as a, a program for addictions. They're, they're in the phone book. Right? But they are connected to the daimi. Participation is not conditional on being in the daimi, but it's related. This is how they have the medicine. So I don't think, our, I don't think we're ready yet in Brazil. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you very much.